The Night Watch, painted by Rembrandt between 1640 and 1642. From the Former Masters by Eugene Fromentin. We know how the Night Watch is hung. It faces the banquet of Arquebusier by van der Helst. And no matter what has been said, the two pictures do not hurt each other. They oppose each other like day and night, like the transfiguration of things and their literal imitation, slightly vulgar and clever. Admit that they are as perfect as they are celebrated, and you will have before your eyes unique antithesis, what La Bruyere calls opposition truths that illuminate one another. I shall not astonish anyone in saying that the night watch possesses no charm, and the fact is without example among the fine works of pictorial art. It is amazing, it is disconcerting, it is imposing, but it absolutely lacks that insinuating quality that convinces us and it almost always fails to please us at first. In the first place, it shocks our logical sense, and that habitual visual rectitude that loves clear forms, lucid ideas, and clearly formulated boldness. Something warns us that our imagination, as well as our reason, will be only half satisfied, and that even the mind that is most easily won over will not submit till the last, and will not surrender without dispute. This is due to various causes that do not all arise from the picture. The light is detestable. The frame of dark wood in which the painting is drowned spoils its middle values and its bronze scale of color and its force and makes it look much more smoked than it is. And lastly, and above all, the exigencies of the place prevent the picture from being hung at the proper height and against all the laws of the most elementary perspective oblige you to look at it from the same level. You are aware that the night watch, rightly or wrongly, passes for an almost incomprehensible work and that constitutes its chief prestige. Perhaps it would have made far less noise in the world if for two centuries people had not kept up the habit of trying to find out its meaning instead of examining its merits, and persisted in the mania of regarding it as a picture enigmatical above all. Taking it literally, what we know of the subject seems to me sufficient. In the first place, we know the names and quality of the personages, thanks to the care with which the painter has inscribed them on a plate at the bottom of the picture which proves that if the painter's fancy has transfigured many things, the chief idea, at least, deals with the customs of local life. It is true that we cannot tell for what purpose these men are going out armed, whether they are going to practice shooting, or on parade, or what. But, as there is no matter here for the deeper mysteries, I am persuaded that if Rembrandt has failed to be more explicit, it is because either he did not wish, or he did not know how to be. And there is a whole series of hypotheses that might be very simply explained by some such matter as inability or intentional reticence. As for the time of day, the most vexed question of all, and the only one, moreover, that could have been settled when it first arose, for fixing that we have no need to discover that the captain's outstretched arm casts a shadow upon the skirt of his coat, it suffices to remember that Rembrandt never treated light otherwise. That nocturnal obscurity is his habit. That shadow is the ordinary form of his poetic feeling and his usual means of dramatic expression, and that in his portraits, in his interiors, in his legends, in his anecdotes, in his landscapes, and in his etchings, as in his paintings, it is generally with night that he makes day. It is agreed that the composition does not constitute the principal merit of the picture. The subject had not been selected by the painter, and the manner in which he intended to treat it did not allow for its first sketch being very spontaneous, nor very lucid. Therefore the scene is indecisive, the action almost null, and consequently the interest is greatly divided. From the very beginning is betrayed an inherent vice in the first idea, and a kind of irresolution in the manner of conceiving, distributing, and placing it. Some men marching, others standing still, one priming his musket, another loading his, another firing a drummer who poses for the head while beating his instrument, a somewhat theatrical standard-bearer, and finally, a crowd of figures fixed in the requisite immobility of portraits. So far as action is concerned, these, if I am not mistaken, are the sole picturesque features of the painting. Is this indeed sufficient to give it the facial, anecdotal, and local feeling that we expect from Rembrandt when he paints the places, things, and men of his time? If van der Helst, instead of seating his arquebusiers, had made them move in any manner whatever, do not doubt that he would have given us the truest, if not the finest, indications of their ways. And as for Franz Hals, you may imagine with what clearness and order, and how naturally he would have disposed the scene. 
How piquant, lively, ingenious, abundant, and magnificent he would have been. The idea conceived by Rembrandt, then, is one of the most ordinary, and I would venture to say that the majority of his contemporaries considered it poor in resources. Some because its abstract line is uncertain, scanty, symmetrical, meagre, and singularly incoherent. Others, the colorists, because this composition, so full of gaps and ill-occupied spaces, did not lend itself to that broad and generous employment of colors which is usual with able palettes. Thus, there is no truth and very little pictorial invention in the general disposition. Is there more in the individual figures? What immediately strikes us is that they are unreasonably disproportioned, and that many of them have shortcomings and, so to speak, an embarrassment of characterization that nothing can justify. The captain is too big and the lieutenant too small, not only by the side of Captain Cock, whose stature crushes him, but also beside accessory figures whose height or breadth gives this somewhat plain young man the air of a youth who has grown a moustache too soon. Regarding the two as portraits, they are scarcely successful ones of doubtful likeness and thankless physiognomy, which is surprising in a portrait painter who had made his mark in 1642, and which affords some excuse for Captain Cox having a little later applied to the infallible Vanderheist. Is the guard loading his musket rendered any better? Moreover, what do you think of his right-hand neighbor and of the drummer? One might say that all these portraits lack hands, so vaguely are they sketched and so insignificant is their action. It follows that what they hold is also ill-rendered. Muskets, halberds, drumsticks, canes, lances, and flagpole, and that the gesture of an arm is impotent when the hand that ought to act does not do so clearly, quickly, or with energy, precision, or intelligence. I will not speak of the feet, which in most cases are lost in shadow. Such in reality are the necessities of the system of envelopment adopted by Rembrandt, and such is the imperious foregone conclusion of his method, that one general dark cloud invades the base of the picture, and that the form floats in it to the great detriment of their points of support. Must we add that the clothes are very similar to the likenesses, sometimes uncouth and unnatural, sometimes rigid and rebellious to the lines of the body? One would say that they are not worn properly. The helmets are stupidly put on, the hats are outlandish and ungracefully worn, the scarfs are in their place and yet they are awkwardly tied. Here is none of that unique ease of carriage, that natural elegance, that negligee dress caught and rendered to the life in which Franz Hals knows how to attire every age, every stature, every stage of corpulence, and certainly also every rank. We are not reassured on this point more than on many others. We ask ourselves whether there is not here a laborious fantasy, like an attempt to be strange, which is not at all pleasing or striking. Some of the heads are very handsome. I have mentioned those that are not. The best, the only ones in which the hand of the master and the feeling of a master are to be recognized, are those which from the depths of the canvas shoot their vague eyes and the fine spark of their mobile glances at you. Do not severely examine their construction, nor their plan, nor their bony structure. Accustom yourself to the grayish pallor of their complexion. Question them from afar, as they also look at you from a distance. And if you want to know how they live, look at them as Rembrandt wants us to look at his human effigies, attentively and long, at their lips and eyes. There remains an episodical figure, which has hitherto baffled all conjectures, because it seems by its traits, its carriage, its odd splendor, and its inappropriateness, to personify the magic, the romantic feeling, or, if you prefer, the misrepresentation of the picture. I mean that little witch-like personage, childlike and crone-like at the same time, with her hair streaming and adorned with pearls, gliding among the guards for no apparent reason, and who, a not less inexplicable detail, has a white cock that at need might be taken for a purse, hanging from her girdle. Whatever right she has to join the troop, this little figure seems to have nothing human about her. She is colorless and almost shapeless. Her figure is that of a doll, and her gait is automatic. She has the air of a beggar. Something like diamonds covers her whole body, and an accoutrement resembling rays. You would say that she came from some jewelry, or old clothes market, or bohemia, and that awakening from a dream she had attired herself in the most singular of all worlds. She has the light the uncertainty and the wavering of a pale fire. 
the more we examine her, the less we can grasp the subtle lineaments that serve as an envelope for her uncorporeal existence. We end by seeing in her nothing but a kind of extraordinarily strange phosphorescence, which is not the ordinary light of things, nor yet the ordinary brilliance of a well-regulated palate, and this adds more sorcery to the peculiarities of her countenance. Note that in the place she occupies, one of the dark corners of the canvas, rather low in the middle distance, between a man in deep red and the captain dressed in black, this eccentric light has much greater force than the most sudden contrast with the neighboring tint, and without extreme care this explosion of accidental light would have sufficed to disorganize the whole picture. 